It's time for the Wrestling Perspective Podcast. I'm Dennis Farrell. Sitting next to me on the other screen right there, Lars Fredrickson going on tour. I'm so excited. If you don't know who he is, rancid, old firm casuals. Uh, Jesus Christ, this guy is everywhere. And you know what? He's my best friend, not yours. So uh, suck it, buddy. And not you, Brody, because you're way bigger than me. So I would never tell you to actually suck it. I just, I chased off Brody King. Yeah, please don't tell me to suck it, uh, Dennis. <laughs> there we go. Well, <laughs> well played. That was like the, that was, you know, that was the, the most not angry way to tell somebody to tell, not you tell know, them. Yeah. Go ahead. Be Lars, honest. I'm sure that you know when you look like uh, you or I, we don't really have to be uh, very aggressive with it. Yes. I we, don't, we don't have to raise our voices yeah. Yeah. very much. I might have peed myself a little bit when you told me that, by the way. So uh, it worked. But uh, listen, Brody King, you've been everywhere. You've done stuff. PWG, MLW, AEW now, Ring of Honor. You're a Crockett Cup winner in 2019. You were in a little band called God's Hate, which is the greatest Christian band ever, I think. <laughs> no? Anyways, uh, Lars, I can't believe we finally made this happen. You know, I'm super excited because watching this guy, you know, do his thing for so long and then knowing that he's got the hardcore punk rock connection, you know what I mean? Uh, I'm super stoked to have Brody King on today um, because it's not, you know, every day that you get somebody of his caliber and somebody of, of you know, somebody of his experience, you know, and you get to sit down and talk to. And by the way, I well, can't stop looking, but is that a Halloween Havoc shirt you have on? Me? No, no me. Oh. oh, yeah, yeah. So my buddies over at Too Sweet Merch, they make these in insanely cool, like, retro kind of T-shirts. And this is a sweatshirt. And I just want – want it, let's give them a shout-out. Too Sweet Merch, thank you very much, Matt, for sending this over. I mean, it's – I mean, not every day do you get Macho Man and Hulk Hogan on, on one sweatshirt. You know what I mean? Matt sounds like a great guy. My email address is dennis 77 feral at gmail.com. You know what? More, more importantly, we got Brody here. Let's not waste his time, Dennis. Let's get into the questions. <laughs> Brody King, thank you once again for enduring uh, countless hours of my texting with you. Uh, I feel like we're, we're best friends now, so I can't wait. The How many best friends you got, Dennis? You got Lars. Now you got me. You're, you're just like pretty quick to the draw with the best friend thing huh i need friends guys i'm lonely uh real lonely i'll be honest you know, brody's brody's like sitting there going fuck man you know i know at least one of these guys here is not in his mom's basement currently <laughs> Hang on. Ma, be quiet uh it's not me guys no uh well listen shenanigans aside let's start peppering you with questions and listen i'm gonna come right out and ask you are one of my favorite ring of honor guys you come in as the mass exodus happens you are a flag bearer for the company now you work for a company who has purchased ring of honor is there a little bit of you that kind of wants to go back to that ring of honor brand and 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 wave that flag or or are you done? You moved on. You're happy. You're glad they're part of there. And if they ask you to go down, you'll do it. But you moved on from the Ring of Honor thing. Uh, yeah, I think it's more the latter. Like, you know, if something happened and there was a storyline that, you know, I was asked to be part of, I would love to go back. Uh, I really enjoyed my time at Ring of Honor. And, you know, when, when I started wrestling, like, I wasn't really familiar with the independence. I wasn't really familiar with a lot of wrestling. Like, you know, I, I watched pretty frequently until I was about 13 and then I kind of fell off completely. Uh, it was like kind of when I was in my like almost mid 20s when uh, Punk was doing this, the Straight Edge Society stuff that kind of like brought me back in. And then from there, I started to watch Ring of Honor. And then when I started wrestling, then I really started watching New Japan and Ring of Honor and stuff like that. And it was it was Ring of Honor that really made me uh, a wrestling fan again, because, you know, how could you not be in some of the greatest wrestling to ever exist, the early 2000s Ring of Honor stuff. So to, to be part of Ring of Honor was, I felt like that was, most guys cut their teeth in Ring of Honor and then they went on to do great things. So, you know, hopefully that, uh, that is also going to be my trajectory, um, fingers crossed. But uh, yeah, I, I would like to go back if, if, it, if I was needed. You know, I, 
had a couple shots at the uh, world title that I didn't really get to clutch up by, uh, you know, outside interference. But I think that maybe that's kind of left off the bucket list. Well, I mean, the wrestling world now is, is, is insane because you got so many pro promotions running. You got indies running every weekend. You got big companies on TV. You get, I mean, there's so much. You, you would need a few weeks to digest a week's worth of wrestling with so much wrestling out. You know what I mean? Um, how do you feel? You know, I know you. You know, haven't you said you kind of fell off as a professional wrestling fan when you came back to that professional uh, watching professional wrestling on, on a, maybe a, a more uh, consistent basis? What did? Uh, what was it besides that whole era of punk and that attitude era? Cause it sounds like you kind of fell off and then a lot of shit happened. What was it that attracted you and you kind of go, fuck man, I, I could do that. I mean, I, I feel like despite like not being a fan, I was always interested in doing it. Like in, mm. in middle school, like I would always tell my friends, like I wanted to be a pro wrestler. And then like, even like getting out of high school, my dad was always a big wrestling fan and he would always be like, well, how do we get you a trial with WWE? I'm like, I don't, I don't know, Dad. Like, I don't know any wrestlers. I don't know how that whole thing works. Like, but he was always convinced that I could be a wrestler, which you know, it turned out I could be. But it wasn't until like one of my friends met like an old worker that he. So my friend was dating uh, a girl that worked for the Kings, and she used to be like an in arena host. So she would talk to fans and stuff like that. And one of the fans found out that her and her boyfriend were wrestling fans and was like hey i used to be a wrestler if you if you or your boyfriend ever want to come like take a bump or you know run the ropes and stuff and my best friend colin was like that's like all he's ever wanted to do was try it out so he went and did it and then i found out about it we went to a santino brothers showcase which was like a little student show inside of the warehouse and it probably had like 30 people in there but it was just like such a tight space and like you just saw these guys like going above and beyond with like stuff that you've never seen before. Like, especially as like a WWE fan from the, you know, late nineties, early two thousands, it was just like, Whoa, this is cool. And, you know, it had that more like underground DIY punk rock approach to it that really attracted me to it. So the next day I signed up for wrestling school. You were a lighting tech. If I got that right. Uh, yeah. So for many years, I, I've listened to a few interviews where you kind of talk about like you still have your card, but you're you're cycling out. How scary was that for you? Because listen, uh, I think we talked to Alex Cologne, who still has a shoot job, and I still have a job, and we, we talk about how scary that is to let that cushion go and take the dive into something of the unknown, like the wrestling industry. Yeah, I mean it, it is weird especially like you know having uh kids and a wife and a house and a mortgage and everything it's just like you know wrestling is very uh it's very unpredictable mm -hmm. and like you know when when my job with ring of honor was over it was like oh shit i hope i get picked up uh by aw or you know or else I'm going to be working my ass off on the indies or I'm going to have to go back to work doing lighting. But I don't know. There's kind of like a, uh, this like freedom that comes with just kind of like letting it all go and just kind of like chasing the dream fully, I guess, that uh, I feel like makes you kind of grind a little bit harder and, and work a little bit harder for it. Uh, you know, I, I think it's good to have a backup plan, which if I ever needed to, I could always kind of go back to it, but I, I kind of like just kind of trying to always make it work. Well, I got kind of a two part question. Did you start playing in bands? Because this, your answer will actually go for the next question. Did you start playing in bands before you started professional wrestling? Yeah. So uh, I was in like a, a bunch of bands, like from my, you know, late teens to early twenties. Um, just we didn't really do much. We did like a couple of local shows. Uh, I was in a band called Sleepwalkers where we did like a West Coast tour. And I think the farthest we got was like Salt Lake City or something like that. But then um, God's Hate started uh, the summer of 2014. And I, it was almost the same exact time that I started wrestling training. So they kind of like started simultaneously with each other. But yeah, God's Hate was definitely the most notable thing I've done music wise. 
Okay, so with that question being asked, like, did you find, you know, because I'm, there's different levels of touring, as we all know, just like there's different ways uh, to work, you know, in, in professional wrestling, you've got, you know, the big show, the bigger shows, and you got the smaller shows. Do you feel like any of that uh, experience that you had with touring bands helped you later on with the professional wrestling gig? Oh, yeah, 100%. And, and it was like, it's funny, because you hear a lot of the, like, wrestlers complaining about oh man this hotel sucks or like this this and that like how like this van sucks you're like dude like i slept on a floor with like dog piss next to my head i don't give a fuck like what the hotel's like like as long as it's you know a place to put my head down uh so i think like you know you're catered to a lot more in in wrestling like you know i feel like with with music a lot you know you'll get offered uh, a rate and then it's like that's like kind of what it, you got to take that rate make that enough to fly your band out and then you kind of make money off the merch but then with like with wrestling it's like oh they're gonna pay your rate they're gonna pay for your flight they're gonna do all this other stuff for you like oh man like all the expenses are already covered and then i just get to make money on top of it like i feel like be, coming from bands and touring and stuff like that i had so much knowledge as far as like self-promotion and merch and everything else that I wouldn't have had otherwise, but also I knew what it felt like to be in a hotel room with 10 other people to sleep on a floor to, you know, do 10 hour drives overnight. So it's like a lot of the stuff that would have been hard for a lot of people to get up used to. I was already used to. Dennis, before you interject, because I want to talk about your merch, because what I see, like, I mean, Dennis, you, you're wearing an NWO shirt that the WWE makes now that's totally just a piece of shit, right? But then you get like, <laughs> then you get like something like your merch, what looks, uh, what, which looks like a band t-shirt, you know what I mean? And so it's like that approach to me, and I see a lot more wrestling t-shirts looking like band merch, like tour merch or whatever yeah. it is. And then it's like, because I mean, obviously the you know the WWE can sometimes be like twenty years behind the curve, but you know, and obviously with that shirt, come on, Dennis, show us that shirt. Look that fucking logo is. Like, Look it's at like, it. It's basically it's like it's 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 like so low. It's like if you tuck the shirt in, you're not going <laughs> to see what the fuck's going to go on, right? I have a stamp yeah. over my fat belly. <laughs> but I mean, I mean like, his, go ahead. The common rule is like the th the three fingers under the collar, and that's like two hands it's like this much <laughs> <laughs> two very large hands it's like andre the giant hands you know what i mean it's like come on wwe get your shit together but so i guess my my, my question is is like is that like i've seen your merch and your merch is fucking sick is that something that like you put as much effort in because i know as like a musician tour musician and like you said that's mostly where you're going to make your money these days you know what I mean? Because the price of gas, everything fucking else, you're just, you're eating shit out there. Uh, is that something that you're, you're, you're consciously putting uh, a lot more effort into as opposed to just saying, ah, I'll just throw this on there and, you know, turn it out? Yeah, 100%. I mean, and it, it comes with like a, its own price too, because I'm so picky about merch designs that I feel like, you know, you look at some of, some of my friends have merch stores and they have like 200 t-shirts and it's like, I wouldn't fucking wear a single thing on it. But you know, totally. I feel like wrestling fans like are not always the most fashionable, so they don't always care. <laughs> so, so it's like, they're, they're selling the shit out of all these merch, you know, like, well, obviously I mean, fucking point, two hand t-shirt. Yeah. But, point, <laughs> made, point made with the guy on the fucking the podcast. <laughs> but like, I, I think my rule of thumb is usually like, if I wouldn't wear it, then I'm probably not going to make it. But, exactly. you know, there has been exceptions to the rule. Like my wife, uh, she's really great at art in general, but like, she's good at pretty good at graphic design as well. And she made this like Wreck-It Ralph, like Donkey Kong type shirt that's on my pro wrestling tea store. And like, I hated it. Uh, and I was like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I'm not like the, the kitty wrestler. Like, I don't want to make like Disney ripoffs. Like this is, I don't know if this is for me. And she's like, just do it. Just see how it goes. And I think to date is probably my highest selling t-shirt. So, you know, what the fuck do I know? I, I, I like, you know, the stuff that like people probably don't recognize. Like I have an agnostic front ripoff shirt with the boots on the front. And then, uh, you know, I like tattoo design t-shirts and stuff like that, but 
for the most part, like you said, I, I like my my wrestling shirts to not look like wrestling merch. Right, right. Sticking with the music, would you say being in a band helped your wrestling stage persona or wrestling helped your on stage persona develop into who you were on stage and in the wrestling ring? Uh, I think both. I mean, you know, obviously being the front man of a band and like singing kind of like the stage fright aspect of it was already kind of gone. I mean, of course you get nervous and, and like it's a new venture. So you're going to have those butterflies and stuff. But as far as like putting yourself out there and like being like more, more, more vulnerable, it was a lot easier. But on top of that, like the better I got at wrestling and the more comfortable I got with like my facial expressions and just like, you know, physical expressions, I think taking that to music, it made me like a more intense vocalist. And like, I get like a lot of compliments from people that are like, you know, you look like you're going to kill somebody while you're on stage. And like, that's kind of what I want to portray in the ring as well. So I think it works out well. I want to get definitely get into the House of Black stuff. But first, I want to talk about Rocky Romero, because he's a long time guest to this this podcast. He's a great dude. And I know you have a history with him. And I've seen you, you know, um, on New Japan shows and things like that. So what is your what is your relationship with Rocky and how has it helped you in your career? So when I was training, uh, there was a school that was much closer to my house. So I'm from the Valley, which is like. This is know, Southern California. Yeah. So I'm, I'm in the Valley. It's like North Los Angeles. And my school was in East L.A. So like I would drive two hours to my school every day and then like an hour home. It was like a pain in the ass. But when I was about a year into my training, uh, Rocky started training at uh, the championship wrestling from Hollywood school, which was like in the Valley. So every Wednesday he would go and, you know, whoever wanted to show up could pay 10 bucks and they would go train for a few hours with Rocky. And it was really bizarre because like nobody went, it would be like me and like three other guys. And, you know, some of the guys didn't really end up doing much, but I think Rocky kind of saw in me that I was willing to kind of do whatever it took to, to take it to that next level. And like, he really took me under his wing and, and like taught me a lot. He taught me a lot about character work and he taught me a lot about just wrestling in general. And I think at that time I, I was really heavily into new Japan pro wrestling and like just wanting to know more about like Japanese style wrestling and like, how to be more than just like you know at the time like obviously wwe was like the the biggest thing that you could do that wasn't ring of honor or new japan it's like i never wanted to be a, a, a wwe big guy like right you know it's kind of like a stereotypical like big boot uh clubbing hand it's like i wanted to be like you know the, the big guys from japan like when bam bam or like all those guys were just doing crazy stuff or just like having these huge hoss matches like shinsuke Kazaki and, and Kobashi like we're just like having these big moments and just being these like massive dudes like I wanted to learn how to do stuff like that and you know even though Rocky is very much a junior heavyweight he was able to kind of like guide me in the right direction and uh yeah I mean he he played a huge part in my in my career and, and in my wrestling in general uh he kind of opened the door for me to go to New Japan for me to go to Ring of Honor and uh I think without him, I wouldn't have had a lot of the connections or experiences I've had so far. We had him on, what was it, a second or third, maybe even fourth time on this podcast. He's like maybe the first four-time guest we've had. Mm. And I think finally we kind of got around to asking and talking to him about, you know, he, he's getting up there in age and finally in this career, he's really getting his comeuppance. He's, he's really getting the recognition he deserves and it couldn't have happened to a greater guy. Yeah, I mean, he he's so humble and like i feel like because he's like so nice and like so he's just you would never think that of the stuff that he's done unless he told you you know what i mean like right. he's he's done it all and like he has been in the business for so long he's known so many people and like he's one of the best wrestlers on the planet and like th that's you know bar none he he will make anyone look incredible and also just entertain his ass off in front of anybody it's like it's no wonder why he'll show up on impact or he'll show up on AEW or ring of honor or anywhere and just like kill it 
and everyone wants them there. It's like you when it's really rare that you see somebody come around and the entire lo locker room is like, oh shit, Rocky's here, and like everyone has to go say hi to him and like talk to him because he's just that guy. Like, and it's not a fake thing at all. Like he's just a good human being. Yeah. Well, I guess that doesn't count as my question. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to go and talk a little bit about your AEW debut. I've heard in a, several past uh, interviews where you kind of talked about how it was kind of a no brainer. It came quick. Uh, you guys all knew it was going to kind of happen. You have a history with black on the Indies and, and whatnot. So in my mind, you've been, I guess, more recognized as a tag team guy. Is there kind of a point where you kind of go, I, I want to see what I can do on my own? Or are you, are you happy being part of a team or in a tag team? It's funny because I've never considered myself like a tag team wrestler. And, you know, it, it wasn't until recently when I was like, well, I've won the Crockett Cup. I've won the NWA tag team title. I've won the Ring of Honor tag team title. I've won the PWG tag team. I guess I am a tag team wrestler. But like... <laughs> In my mind, it's like I'm I'm a singles wrestler, but I guess I just work really well with the team. Like I feel like I'm always willing to I, I just like collaborating with people. I like seeing what we can do together and like take your best skills and my best skills and put them together and, and just see what we can do at out of it. And you know, obviously there's a lot of fun in, in being a tag team wrestler. Like when you're on the tag rope, I feel like a lot of wrestlers don't take advantage of like hyping up the crowd or just like yelling at their opponent and hyping them up it's like you know you see a lot of guys just kind of like hanging out there holding the tag rope like oh come on tag me in it's like come on man like you're half the show right now like get the crowd fired up do whatever it takes like to keep, to keep it going but i think going to ring of honor like that made me more of a tag wrestler it's like i started with villain enterprises and and marty was a great wrestler and he taught me a lot about I mean, wrestling in general, but like, a, a, especially a lot about tag team wrestling. And then of course being with PCO was insane. And he's like a legendary tag team wrestler. So I got to have a lot of firsthand experience and like, you know, how to do things the right way and like how to succeed in that. And I was kind of thrown into the fire right away. It's like within the first six months, I was the ring of honor, six man tag team champion and tag team champion. And it's like, we went into Madison square garden, going for the uh iwgp heavyweight tag team championships so it's like i got to learn from the briscoes i got to learn from god it's like i, I had a pretty good tutelage of uh, of people to to pick their brain about tag team wrestling well you know I, one of the observations i always make when i watch you wrestle is that you move like a front man like if i feel i feel like the way that you move in the ring is like a singer moves on the stage you got <laughs> a different presence the House of Black thing here is like in, insanely cool for me to, uh, as a fan for me and watching it kind of unfold and expand. And I don't want any giveaways here and I'm not looking for any kind of dirt. But was this something that like obviously, I mean, it was obviously a natural thing, but going into AEW, did you want this to happen? Like coming back with him and, and all this or did you want, were you envisioning, uh, envisioning something different for yourself? No, I. I think I, I very much wanted it to happen, like especially once uh, Tom from Malachi was released from WWE and it became more of a possibility. It was like, you know, this could be really cool. Like there's no other tag team maybe in history that looks the way that we do. It's like, you know, there's a lot of tattooed wrestlers, but there is, there isn't like heavily tattooed wrestlers like like the two of us and like obviously like our styles are very much different but they also complement each other right right uh, you know i feel like both of us have had a lot of real life experience with maybe you know getting into fights so it's like we kind of have that little grit to us as well um I, I i've always looked up to tom as well he was kind of a mentor of mine like when I started wrestling and, and like when he, his time in WWE, like we talked a lot and I would send him matches and he would give me notes and stuff like that. So just being able to work with him, he has like such a creative mind for wrestling and nothing is, nothing is just basic. It, it's always elevated. It's like, even the promos that we do at the show, we're never doing it in front of like, 
you know, the backdrop with someone with the microphone being like, oh, what do you think about this? It's, it's always like, hey, can we do it in this like weird back corner of the room that looks like a little bit industrial and like have it really dark and like ominous. And, and it's like, we create a lot, he creates a lot out of nothing. And, and he has like a specific vision in mind. And, you know, his aesthetic matches very well with mine. You know, there's, a, there's some differences, like, you know, he's very much more into like, black metal and stuff like that whereas i'm more like punk and hardcore and like with some death metal but involved but, it, but it's not really those musical genres are not really a far cry from each other no and, and like and, and you can pull from all of them to make this really cool creative thing like you know a lot of stuff in in my promos or like in my captions that i use for twitter or whatever like are usually a lyric of some band so it's like these little like Easter eggs that we plant around her, I think are really cool. And, you know, a lot of people, I wouldn't say a lot of people, but there's some people that are like, I don't get what they're saying. I don't understand them. Like <laughs> they have stupid tattoos. I don't like the way they look, but you know what? Just like, you know, punk and hardcore, it's not fucking meant for you. Like this is for us and it's for the people that get it. And, and it's not meant for, to be liked by everybody. Well, and I think that's the sense of what's so real about you guys and the stable that's being built. Because, I mean, you had things there that were kind of the darkest on the dark, like the dark order, but that, and not taken away from any one of those guys, but it's now become something a little bit more comedic. Comedic, is that the word? Name, the word? Comedic, yeah. 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 And which is fine. But with that name, you, you're thinking it's kind of like what you guys are doing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I guess you know, as you're kind of looking forward with this, because to me, it looks like when you guys are doing promos and the vignettes that you guys do, that looks like some, like some band shit, you know what I mean? And uh, do you feel like because of this creative freedom that you have in AEW, and I think just across the board in professional wrestling, minus maybe one or two companies, do you feel like this kind of stuff, uh, what, let, me, let me rephrase it. Do you feel like this wouldn't have been able to happen without some understand what we were going to people at AEW really understand what we're going for but it's getting they always try to cater to, to the to the masses but sometimes you need to cater to to that that niche audience that like is underrepresented and like maybe doesn't have like something to really latch on to and I feel like something like House of Black kind of fits the mold and you know on top of that everyone individually in the group is a great wrestler so when we have these big matches like the one at Revolution and we kind of just go balls to the wall that's going to impress and and make a fan of, out of most people even if you didn't understand what the promos were or like what our whole look is about like you're gonna go damn those guys were awesome all right, all right. i'm glad you guys said all that because uh buddy matthews is the odd man out aesthetically in this group can we like spray some tattoos on them or something or or just put some dirt on them, just make them look a little grimy because like you guys were all talking about, you know, death metal and dark punk and all this stuff. He reminds me of flock of seagulls in this group. <laughs> yeah. But he looks, I feel like if buddy looked just like a normal guy, it might be a little bit more jarring, but like he is so unbelievably jacked that it's like almost like he, I don't know of another person that really looks the way he does. Like, you know, you got like Brian Cage or like someone else, but like Buddy is just this like this massive human with like the most muscle definition I've ever seen. And he looks like he's going to kick the shit out of you at all times. And he's unbelievably athletic. Absolutely. We need to paint little demons on his abs or something, guys. <laughs> well, so, I mean, you know, that's one of the things. I think it's kind of, when I see it, I know it's some pagan Viking shit. Like I get it. I get the whole thing. And I mean, and I, like you said, it's a very niche thing. But like a guy like Pac is a guy that I think could fit into that whole thing because I, I know he's he's got he's got the look and I think Buddy fits in perfectly. But, um, you know, do you guys ever talk about like, you know, how we're going to evolve this? Like, is it, you know, 
because it kind of feels like more could more people could come in obviously in its own time but do you ever are you guys ever talking creatively about how you're going to evolve this and make it bigger yeah i mean we're, we're always talking about like what we can do to make it more than what it is and like even if it's not like now but like when um we haven't really discussed about like adding new people because we're just you know with buddy and i being so new to the company and i mean even malachi has only been there since august it's still like we're still trying to like really establish ourselves and make the house of black like a staple in AEW because it's one of the few things in AEW that was like created there it's like you know you had a lot of things that were created elsewhere that are kind of brought there and like have gotten over there but AEW in essence has been fully created at AEW can i pitch one person i think would be perfect for your group uh no not me not me guys <laughs> you're good <laughs> Lars Fredrickson I mean I would okay, do that okay not, thank you, thank I, you. I, I, listen I'm not even allowed in the building okay I get it I understand I'm I'm like your nerdy uncle that shows up in a sweater vest and you're like <laughs> never mind him he's gonna have his turkey and he's gonna leave so <laughs> we're good I'm not pitching me um uh, you, you have this like dark demeanor do you ever and as we're talking about creative for you personally, do you ever just kind of wish sometimes you could go out and do some comedy stuff? Because I know you're a funny guy. You you enjoy humor. Uh, is that just, I mean, listen, I know you're not going to do it because you, you cash your checks being dark and tattooed and, and or I'm going to kill you. But is there a little part of you that wishes you could go out and do a little bit of comedy? Yeah, sometimes. And, and I feel like there is a place for it, like where I can be myself, but also be humorous like uh, I've had matches on the indies where like uh we wrestled um Rock Ness which is Yuma and um Kevin Martinson and we wrestled them at bar wrestling and it was like a fans bring the weapons match and there was like all kinds of ridiculous shit that the fans brought but someone just brought a banana and like we did like a slip on the banana spot so it's like <laughs> I, I I I like ran the ropes and one of them threw the banana in and I slipped on it it's like stuff like that it's like it's not really taking yourself out of your gimmick or, you know, your personality, but like, you're just kind of, you know, taking the piss out of yourself. And I think that's, yeah. that's fun at times too. Yeah. I definitely think that there's always more room to develop your character. When you kind of set into wrestling, was there like something that you really wanted to do? Like, you know, I, you were talking about earlier, like, you could go and be the big man and just do the clobber, but you wanted to move more like a Bam Bam, which I think you do. I think you're 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 more like a, a Stan Hansen, Dick Murdoch, in my opinion, somewhere in between there. But uh, as far as like your own character goes, where are you drawing inspiration from? Where are you kind of like you know? Are you reading things? You're watching things on TV. Where are you taking it from? Uh, I mean, a lot of stuff is just like it's from all over the place it's from movies it's from you know tv shows from music like obviously a lot of my imagery and stuff like that comes from from music um but wrestling wise you know i like you said i love stan hansen and terry gordy and like all those guys and like trying to see how i can make like you know if a dr Death steve williams was wrestling in the modern era like what would he do or like you know, I, I always like to say, like, I'm trying to be Bruiser Brody or Stan Hansen in the year 2022 with, like, making everything a little bit more uh, modern. You know, I think a lot of guys, like, uh, a lot of stuff in the early 2000s Ring of Honor is what I draw a lot of inspiration from, from, like, you know, Claudio or Chris Hero or, like, you know, a lot of those guys did unbelievable stuff for their sides. Like even, you know, Brody Lee was doing crazy stuff in Chikara. And even when he was coming back to AEW and, you know, obviously there's a, there's a fine line where you are doing too much and you're being too much like the, like the smaller guys. But I think that that's part of the fun is finding the, the space where you can like pull out a big high flying move or like a crazy athletic move where people are like, whoa what the fuck did he just do like if i do a topic on Hilo or a suicide dive or like something like that something that people aren't expecting wow 
Uh, you're absolutely correct because once again, we've we text back and forth a lot of times when we watch AEW, and uh, Lars is a massive fan of yours, and he's like, "Oh man, did you see that move? That reminds me of a match I watched uh, on a videotape because he's a tape trader, and he'll." And now I'm going to track down this match of like Stan Hansen in 1984 in Japan, which I'm making all those dates up. And I'm like, <laughs> holy cow, that that. So I like doing that with Lars because, you know, Lars, Lars and I grew up in, I don't want to say different eras, but with different wrestling tastes. Lar, uh, I'm a NWA WCW guy. He's like an old school tape trader, New Japan. And I get to learn a lot from him. Do you, and you've kind of mentioned that there was a gap in your, your wrestling watching years. Do do you have a guy that, that tells you go watch this map match? Maybe you can draw from, you know, this move here and, you know, 1981. Uh, Honestly, it's a lot of the time it's Andy Williams, uh, the butcher from every time I die uh, and, you know, AEW, but he, from the second that i started wrestling he gave me like a list of like wrestlers to watch and like matches that i had to see it was like i think that you would be great at doing this or like if he and he's just like kind of like that to everybody he he, you know if he sees something and he's like a wrestling historian he knows fucking everything and everybody and like he's been wrestling he's been watching since he was a kid and he never stopped and lars i don't know how how many conversations you've had with andy but i feel like you guys could go on for hours about just everything from music to wrestling but if he if andy sees that he saw something cool that he thinks that you can do or would fit in your wheelhouse he's going to tell you about it and i think that's one of the coolest things and you know it's something that a lot of wrestlers aren't willing to do is is be you know willing to give out information and not just like hoard it for themselves or you know they want to be more over than the other guy when you're trying to like make everybody better i think that's when the product itself succeeds um but yeah i think that that's him him and and obviously tommy he sends me stuff all the time too it's like i think that this this would be a cool move for you or like check out this match and he watches like a lot of like real fighting like ufc and like thai boxing and stuff like that so like there'll be some like weird stuff that he saw that maybe he thinks that i could do or that he can do and like we kind of mesh it all together well, that reminds me, I'm going to text you after we're done because uh, I need to get your address. I have a book that I think that you'd really, really enjoy. But on, but on the top of, of Andy, I mean, what a lovely motherfucker and somebody that would probably could fit in the House of Black at some <laughs> point. You know what I mean? I mean, if we're talking tattoos or just, you know, but I think he has the persona that fits, uh, fits that. The one thing that I will say um, about, uh, you know, you wrestle a lot like a a Japanese style wrestler. I mean, you can see a lot of that influence into you. The American fan, I feel like, is now way more educated than than he ever has been, he or she has ever been. Um, And I think it's it's like they they almost have been to some indie shows uh, where they're even reacting like a Japanese audience. Yeah. Um, is that something that you can kind of pick up on? Like when, I mean, cause you wrestle a lot of Indies, you obviously wrestle for AEW, like reading the crowd, this is something that's, I've never really asked another uh, wrestler before, but do you kind of know what kind of crowd it is before you kind of walk in there? Are you like paying attention to the matches before? Are you kind of getting the vibe? Like, how are you reading the crowd? How are you making sense of it? Uh- yeah so i really like to watch a lot of at least the first few matches like if i'm on later in the card i'll definitely watch a a lot of the first few matches just to see like how the crowd is reacting to certain things like are they going to want to see only high spots are they like an old school crowd that like you know maybe is a bunch of families that are just going to kind of pop for the you know basic storyline stuff um i like to to get a get a a bearing on, on where i'm at with the crowd with that but a lot of the time it's just you know, while you're in the ring and, and hearing what they're reacting to, it's like, if I chop somebody, it gets a big noise and the whole place explodes. It's like, okay, this is an easy night. Like they're going to kind of bite on, on anything that looks like it's devastating. Um, but then you have the, you know, you have the fans that are like the PWG fans who are, are really hard to impress. And like, you have to really kind of pull out all the stops to kind of get, 
to where you want to be in the match. And, and I feel like AEW is a very good um, mix of a little bit of everything. I feel like a lot of the fans there are very familiar with like Japanese style wrestling. And they're very familiar with independent wrestling. Um, but even if you're not, even if you're just a casual fan, a lot of those things are going to probably wow you at some point. And, you know, it might be a little bit overwhelming, but once you're able to like maybe watch it back a couple of times and digest it, you'll probably be pretty impressed by it. But um, I, I like to have a lot of my wrestling just be very straightforward and like, you kind of strip it down and like make it as realistic as possible. I want you to think that I'm actually elbowing this man in the jaw and trying to break it and, and punch him in the face. And I want everything that I do to look and look like it hurts. Well, in a few minutes, we are going to play the fastest growing game in all of American wrestling podcast history. It's going to be called What is Brody King Watching in a, in a minute. But before we get there, we got a couple more questions apiece. Uh, you're a guy that in the grand scheme of wrestling history, you got to where you are pretty quickly. Uh, do you still feel like, and I know in past you've said you can always learn and you're always trying to learn, but would you... Would you still call yourself somewhat, because you don't look it, but somewhat green? Or are you past the green and more experienced now? Where do you rank your talent level for how fast you are to where you are? Uh, I never try to think of it like that, but, you know, because there's definitely times where, like, it'll be dependent on the show. Like, I went and did a, a show for my school back in uh, uh, February, and obviously I'm, like, way further advanced than you know mostly anybody there because a lot of them are still students at the time so it's like I was able to kind of like give a lot of advice to those guys and like have a match with somebody where I kind of like took the reins and like I knew what that crowd would bite on and then afterwards he's like wow like how did you know that they would come up for this part of that part I'm like dude it's just like kind of repetition and like knowing like what is gonna be placed where and, and like how to how to get the proper reaction but then you know when I go to somewhere like AEW, it's like you know you're around cm punk and brian danielson and john moxley and like kenny omega it's like all these guys that have done anything and everything there is to do in wrestling it's like and i'm i might as well be a young boy compared to those guys so it's i'm always trying to ask people for advice ask people like if they saw my match if they think i could do anything better and like you know, it, it feels good when they go, no, nah, man, I think that was really awesome. Or if like they asked me why I did something and they thought it was really cool, like that's really awesome too. But I always just like to know what I can do better and like how I can improve. And I feel like a lot of guys are get, got, get kind of thrown off by it because, you know, I'll ask somebody that is probably like on my level and like, like, hey, man, what do you think about that? What can I do better? And like, what the fuck are you asking me? Like, we're like doing this, like we're at the same Thing. I'd say yeah but like everyone has a different perspective everyone has a different mindset and, and I like to know you know if you think like Ethan Page pulled me aside the other day and he was just like hey man can I can I give you like something I was like yeah of course you, I, like, we've been friends for a long time I was like why are you even asking just tell me but he was just like I, I just don't want to offend you or anything and then there was a spot where uh I gave Pac like this big chop and it was just like thunderous and then the crowd was asking for one more and then I did it and it was just a dud. And I was like, I already knew I was like, I fucking shouldn't have done the second one. The first one was enough, <laughs> but he was like, he's like, you should have done that first chop and just like walk to the middle and just like let the crowd react to it. And I was like, fuck, you're right. And it's like, just those little things, like, you know, that's what I want to know. Like, I want to know what, I don't, I don't ever want to know what I did good. I want to know what I did bad and like what I can improve on. So I think that, you know, I'm very much still and always will be a student of the game. Well, you've mentioned, you know, a lot of these guys like Mox and Punk and, and Danielson and stuff like that. And there's never been I've never heard a bad word about you. All I hear is, is good stuff. Um, now, having these guys and some of these guys, I mean, you're talking about the era of wrestling that you fell in love with and made you want to do it. Is it kind of surreal for you at times to be in the same locker room and get feedback from these guys or maybe even get accolades from these guys? I mean, dude, it's, it's surreal for me to be on this podcast right now talking to you, if I'm going to be honest. <laughs> like, like, you were in a band that, like, were, was the formidable years of me becoming, like, a punk kid. And, like, 
you know, my first set of bands was like Bad Religion, Pennywise, and Ransom. It's like, if it wasn't for those bands, then I might not be the human being I am today. So, you know, but as, as far as wrestling, yeah, it's like, did I ever think that I would be in the same locker room with CM Punk, the guy that like got me back into wrestling? And it's like, no, like I never thought he was coming back to wrestling. And, you know, I had plenty of friends that knew him and like talked to him and like the, my friend Zach, who like lives at my house, he has been friends with punk forever and like they were playing video games one day and someone asked like oh what what promotion does does brody work for and zach was like uh and then punk was playing with him he's just like oh he works for new japan and ring of honor it's like oh so he knows i exist like that's pretty cool uh and then now like being like friends with them and like talking to him and like hanging out with him is is really awesome and i told him at revolution after he had his match with mjf I was like, hey, man, um, I know you're really emotional right now. Like You've had this crazy ass match, but that was incredible. And I got to let you know, you are the reason like I'm a probably a professional wrestler. Like you got me back into wrestling. And like he's just like, dude, come on, don't don't tell me this right now. And like he like went, he like went back into like the doctor's office. But it was like being able to share that moment with him was was awesome. And yeah, you know, so many guys whoever thought that we would see Brian Danielson back in like really back in his, you know, roots and like, right. like he hadn't missed a step. He looks like the same guy that was, you know, wrestling Kenta in 2005. Yeah. It's like, he's putting on unbelievable yeah. clinics. And like, I think we're just seeing this, this whole new love of professional wrestling from some of these guys. I noticed that you left me out of the whole praise thing for Lars. I want to give you ample amount of time <laughs> to talk about how I am awesome and your favorite podcaster. Go on. Uh, All right, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lars, I don't know if, if you remember this, but I have a funny story. We wrestled, okay. uh, we wrestled at, it must have been APW, and we wrestled Reno Scum. And right. you and your son were sitting front row. And I was like, oh shit, Lars Fredrickson is here. And like, you were booing us. And I was like, this, no, don't boo me. <laughs> like, but then like, there was a spot in the match where uh, my tag partner, Tyler Bateman, caught, I think, Adam on a dive and uh -huh. just smoked your son. And yeah. like, I think you guys laughed. And, and I was like, oh shit. Like, and I think Bateman has still not forgiven himself to this day for like <laughs> falling into your son. But I, I, that was like a moment where it's like, oh, shit, Lars is here. I wonder if we could talk to him afterwards. And then it was like you were gone because we crushed your child. And I was like, no. Well, the, the problem was is that it was not only my child, but it was his, his, uh, his well, he brought one of his buddies. And I didn't know the parents very well, but I knew that, <laughs> the, that the, these Wolfgang and his buddy, Luca, were, were, were you know, they, they ended up starting a band together, you know, and they played some shows together, whatever. That's later on. But. You know, so you're bringing somebody else's kid to wrestling, and Kevin Gill, I think, was the one that I think that hooked it all up. Yeah. And I and I'm like, look, dude, is this going to be like a family show or is this more like a, you know, whatever? And he said, no, no, it's straight up family. And then, you know, whatever. Then the next <laughs> thing, you know, one of you guys is like on my on my friend my my son's friend's lap. I'm just, but he thought it was great. I mean, and oh, ended up good. bragging. So all is forgiven. I was more, I more had heat with Kevin Gill for telling me it was a family show. There's no fucking barrier or anything. It was like a piece of rope. I don't even think there was that, but I do remember that match. But Reno scum, I mean, you know, they're, they're like the homies from Reno. So it's like, oh, yeah. you know, you, you know, you know, but uh, I guess if I, if I had a last question for you, um, which I kind of started thinking about, you know, a lot of um, like people from, I feel like more, I, I, I'm trying to find the term for it because I don't want to say alternative, but I almost feel like it's a lot more people who are more like outcasts are finding professional wrestling as an outlet now. You know, I mean, it's almost like watching new punk bands pop up, but now you're seeing it in wrestling. And um, what was it that attracted you personally? Because I know that you were into punk and you're, you know, you obviously play in a great hardcore band, all these things, but like, what is it about I know what it is for me, and I'm just wanting to see if it's anything similar. But what was it about uh, for you that like attracted it, or, or, attracted this kind of performing art, this kind of thing, this carny shit, basically? When it, in a nutshell, what are you attracted to it? So why did you get attracted to it so much? 
I don't know, something fucked up in my brain. Like, <laughs> and, and, and like, that's kind of like the, you know, why, why do I, why am I attracted to punk and hardcore music where you just go jump off a stage or beat each other up and like come back the next week and, you know, do it again. It's, we'll do it it's, again. It, why, why am I purposefully damaging my body for the rest of my life for the entertainment of others that might just, you know, not give a shit at all? I don't know. Like, it's just, there's something wrong with all of us, you know, my, my trainer always said, you gotta be like, there's a special like level of crazy stupid that you have to be to, to be a pro wrestler. And I think the same to be like a, a full-time touring musician too. Like we just, we can't be, we can't be tied down to like, you know, normalcy or like regular society. Like if I do, if I work in a cubicle from nine to five, like no offense to anybody that does that. If that's how you make a living, you know, I respect the shit out of you because I couldn't do it. Like, that would be my hell, it, uh, honestly, because I, I just have to keep moving. I have to keep being in different places and seeing different people. And like, you know, obviously I have my home base where I have my kids and my wife. And and when I'm here, it's like, that's that's all I'm doing is, is just being here. But when I'm out, it's like, that's that's a life fulfilled for me, I guess. Oh, well, sorry, Dennis, let me piggyback on this because it's something interesting. And I just want to get to Because, I mean, you express yourself. So do you feel like uh, it, it's both for you as well? Uh, yeah, it, it's like, obviously, expressing myself physically through wrestling is a lot more. And I feel like when I get to kind of take a break and go do a show, it, that's almost like more it, that's like my therapy like from mm. wrestling it, it's funny because it's like wrestling is like what balances my life and and you know that that physical exertion and like depleting me mentally is like what is keeping me balanced in my normal everyday life right. but then being able to go and express myself through music is like my therapy from wrestling it, it, it has this whole like balance to it i don't know it's pretty cool fair enough thank you my last question actually is for Lars, who is, you know, the new voice of GCW, it feels like, by the way, oh, phenomenal. Shit. I haven't even I haven't even given you props for what an amazing job you did at the GCW show Devil in a Dress, a new dress, I'm sorry. So go go get it if you've not seen it. Listen to Lars. He's does what about four or five matches on uh, on the stick? Three or four, I think. Ph phenomenal job. I Thank even you. sent him a couple texts. Like I, I picked up on the Bobby the Brain Heaton thing, and I was like, "Oh man, I loved it. It made me laugh, and I, I loved it." Now, how would you call a Brody King match? <laughs> well, number one, I'd put him over, you know, and I, I would probably, if it was like a House of Black, I would probably want to play like more of like a heel Bobby Heenan commentator because I, I feel like that's a part of wrestling that I miss a lot is having your good guy, bad guy commentator, just like you have a good guy, bad guy in the ring. And I feel like when they do that with AEW, when they bring out like a William Regal or an MJF, even a CM Punk who's great on the stick, he can still be, you know, somewhat of a heel to the bad guy. Does that make sense? There's yeah, like I, think a, Taz, I think Taz does that really well. Yeah, I think you're right as well. Um, and, and I think I, I think Taz is, is, is great along uh, across the board. But I, but I feel a little bit like that's a part of wrestling that we don't get to see anymore. You know what I mean? And when it's tried in like the WWE, it's like, just shut up, just shut yeah. up and get, get the thing from the ear. <laughs> you know what? It's, I don't even want to hear it anymore. It's like, I can't even, you know, whatever. But I feel like you have to kind of take a side. One guy has to take somewhat of a side. One guy's got to call it down the middle. One guy's got to take a side either way. I prefer the guy. So I would probably you know, more of a house of black thing, you know what I mean? Like, and just talking about, you know, well, you know, whatever, I don't know. It would, it, I would have to, you know, I would have to wrestle for GCW. I'll demand to call your match. And then there we go. <laughs> there we go. All right. Well, listen, uh, Lars, if you don't have anything else, it's time to play the hottest game in all of wrestling podcast. Bear with us, Brody. 
It's <laughs> what is Brody King watching? Brody, basically, it's three rounds. We, me and Lars, guess what you're currently watching right now? None of this. I watched it a month ago, or I used to always watch it. You get to hand up points everywhere. For, every, what? Everywhere from a half point to a full point. And at the end of three, whoever wins, wins. If it's tied, we go into sudden death fourth round, which we've done twice. By the way, Lars, you're what, five, six, and one right now? Uh, I feel like I, I'm in a slump <laughs> and it's going to end today. So, okay. Brody, do you watch TV? Yes. All right. That's all we need to know. Well, uh, no, no, no. I, 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 well, I'll have another question. Is well, he, is, are you a cable guy or are you a streaming guy? Uh, streaming, but I mean, I watch HBO uh, and Hulu and like I watch, I watch everything. So, but basically, you, you consume your TV but through apps. Yes. Okay. Well, Lars, you have champions advantage. Well, no, no, no. I'll let you go. I'm gonna let you go first. Me go first. He says he has HBO. I'm gonna go Peacemaker. Yes. Ooh. Ooh. Is that it? Wait. So you said currently watching it right now? We because I did go. watch that like a month ago. <sighs> Fuck. Well, no, no. I'll give that to you. I'll give that to okay. you because I, you know, that's. I mean, that's that's relatively new. Okay. Current, it's okay. like if it was, if like I said, oh, do you watch Sesame Street? And you're like, yeah, I did that when I was nine. Then that <laughs> doesn't count. <laughs> All right. You know All what right. I mean? I'm not saying that you would be watching Sesame Street when you're nine, anyways. But you know what I'm saying. Right. Okay. So that's one for Dennis. So so I'm gonna say that you're watching the new Vikings. No. Fuck. Hmm. Because that's where you could draw a lot of inspiration from. I'm not just, you know. I might, I might check it out now. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say Saturday Night Live. No. Yeah. God, no. That's not even funny anymore. <laughs> Thanks for taking the winds out of my sails, bud. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go with, do you consume TV with your better half? Yes. Okay, so then I'm going to go with, the new sex in the city no god no okay all right okay i'm fuck i fuck <laughs> i don't know the proper name of the show but it's the uh the series version of tiger king with kate mckinnon uh carol baskins and the tiger king guy are you watching that show you really love saturday night live don't you I'm out. No, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's on Hulu. There's, there's a, it's, it's, it's a te television series depicting uh, the Tiger King uh, documentary. It's really good. No, I, I don't watch it. Well, I, you got to be a horror fan, so I'm trying to think, like, you know, how I could. Uh, I'm trying to think what a good. Uh, hmm, hmm. I know he's probably seen the new Batman film, right? We're not doing that. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just trying to. I'm. It's like laws of deduction, Dennis. Why don't you chill out? This is how I always win. <laughs> this is how I'm winning all the time. Okay. So, let me think here. Uh, 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 I'm gonna go with um, Cowboy Bebop on Netflix. That's good. No. That's okay, good. Dennis, you win. That, that that was a good show, by the way. Thank God. Yes, the, the live action Cowboy Bebop. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's really yeah. good. I haven't watched. It. I, honestly, that's my that's my wife's favorite anime, and I've never really watched it. Well, you know, I, 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 it's really good. It's really good. I'm I'm gonna take a hill, Mary. Guess but I know I've won. I want to spike the ball finally because you did that to me last week. You son of a bitch. Um. <laughs> I, I got lucky with a cartoon last week. I'm going to go back to the cartoon well and just guess. Currently, are you uh, watching like a King of the Hill or something? I mean, that's not even current. Are, I mean, <laughs> currently, are you watching <laughs> You it, just said like that. That's like the Sesame Street question. I like, guess, of course, I've watched current King of the Hill. Are you currently watching it? No, but I've watched it. <laughs> I've watched the whole series like 10 times. All right, it was worth a try. All right. <laughs> Finally, though. I currently, did win. currently, the big the big shows that are are in rotation right now uh, are Snowfall, mm -hmm. um, Tokyo Vice is unbelievable. Fuck. Fuck. 
That, that I I could have swore you were gonna hit, hit that one. I, I was almost there, bro. But then when oh. I went, just to like, cause I mean, I watch a lot of programming with my better half, and it's like ninety day fiance, and you know, before the ninety days and stuff like that. That's actually <laughs> besides wrestling, what I consume somewhat the most. But it's it's just about that Spain time. But after she goes to sleep, then I'm on to my shows. You know what I mean? So the uh, only reality what, TV I watch is like. RuPaul's Drag Race and uh, the Challenge, but other than that, my wife knows that I cannot stand like Ninety Day Fiance and you know my thousand pound sisters or whatever. I don't. I, yeah, I'm out. <laughs> I you know I I actually enjoy Ninety Day Fiance just because it's just so. Some of these people are just so fucking idiotic. Like I, I, I mean? do get a little wrapped up. Like I'll I'll be like laying there and she's watching an episode and I'll start asking questions and I'm like. <laughs> What the fuck am I getting? I'm, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> Tap out on that one. All right. Well, anyways, are you still playing Call of Duty? By the way. Oh yeah. Oh, can can we play together one night? No. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> at, 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 <laughs> oh, don't say it out of the air. Everybody will try to friend you. I'm not going to bleep it either. So we'll we'll do this off the air because all right, all right. I can say my name. Nobody cares, by the way, because I'm a Tiger King nerd. My getting the gamer tag is Hell Carol, Carol Baskin. Are you good at Warzone? I'm okay. I play for fun. Like me and my buddies will get on and make fun of each other and have fun. Uh, I like Warzone. I I enjoy playing the uh, new the new Vanguard. That's a fun game for me too. Yeah, I don't, I don't really play like the, the multiplayer a lot, but I, I do love playing War, Warzone. All right. Well, I'll send you a text with my gamer tag. And if you block me, you block me. If you add me. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's let's do some quick promoting. By the way, on the bottom of the screen, guys, you'll be able to see Lars's tour dates. If he's coming to a town near you, go see him. He and by what, by, Just real quick, New Jersey is sold out. So you got to go to New York now. Oh, yeah. Go to New York. Are you coming I, to Atlanta, Lars? Um, I, we tried it, it, a lot of the things that was, that were being put together, like Atlanta was definitely on the, on the list. And, and I think I'm coming there trying to get there in the fall now. Oh, nice. Well, uh, look down there, uh, breaking news, by the way, sold out. So don't go to that one. I just got New the, Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. I just got the word New Jersey sold out. Everybody <laughs> came into my earpiece. So, uh, <laughs> breaking news, uh, but, uh, go, go see a tour date. He's has these awesome records that he's selling, uh, autographed and you can buy them only tour available, right? Yep. Green vinyl. Let's Green talk vinyl. about, let's talk about Brody. Yes. And where we can, where we can find Brody King on, on his, uh, Instagram, Twitter. What, what are all your little call signs, Brody? Uh, Twitter and Instagram at Brody X King. Uh, you can find me on Pro Wrestling Tees uh, under Brody King, and you can find out about more God's Hate stuff uh, at God's Hate or God's Hate US. If I buy a Brody King shirt, is it going to come like this bullshit right here? Because I, I can fit another logo with something else between. That it really depends on if you're buying it from me, which like if I'm selling it at like an independent show, it'll be high quality. I can't promise, you know, usually Pro Wrestling Tees does a decent job, but I can't promise anything. Yeah. They well, did They did send somebody a shirt where they printed the front pocket logo and then the back was just blank. And it's like, <laughs> what the fuck, guys? And they can they can be a little hit and miss, but in yeah. general, in general, they do pr a pretty good product. Well, listen, for everybody at home, the show's over. We'll say our goodbyes off the air. It's this week's Wrestling Perspective. Go tell a friend, rate, subscribe, do all that stuff. Just Google it. You'll find us. No need to talk about it. Lars Fredrickson, myself, Dennis Farrell, and the gracious Brody King. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for having me, guys.